Shalom, shalom. <clears throat> Brother Don Nall with the hopeful elect, man, coming back to edify um, Israel as best as I can. Um, it's my prayer and my desire that all Israel might be saved. Um, today's going to be a nice little lesson, man. Uh, not going to be before you guys too long. Uh, you know, you know how I like to do it. You know how I like to, uh, you know, try to be precise and accomplish much with 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 short speech uh, paraphrasing. Right. Um, uh, so, yeah, man, let's just jump right into it, man. The title of this video is going to be uh, what is the greatest commandment? Um, if you peep that little sound bite at the beginning of the song that I just played, man. My boy, The Rock, he had implemented this question in one of his songs, right? And um, he was asking his kids. And I think it's important, man, you know, that you you teach them from the, from, you know, from, from, the, from their youth. Because it's important to know these things, right? And the meaning of these things, the meanings of these things, uh, especially once we get into it uh, and how deep, you know, uh, Christ's parables really were. So uh, first and foremost, uh, we want to give all honor and glory to uh, the father, right, by way of his son, who was an instrument of salvation for the nation, as we like to say. I'm Brother Donal, and um, I'm on here, you know, trying to spread this gospel, trying to make my calling and election sure that one day I might be hopeful enough to make it into that uh, election, right, that, um, that glorious number. But without further ado, let's jump straight into it. Um, bring this back. And a lot of you guys may have um, may have, you know, dove into this or seen this before, read it before, heard it before. You know, it's very it's a classic, you know, um, let's, let me go through the whole chapter. So it's Matthew chapter 22. And we're going to start at verse 34. Right. Um. Yeah, we started 34. So Matthew 22 and 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, right, that they're, they're talking to Christ, right? He's going to ask his question to Christ. Verse 36, Master, which is, a, which is the great commandment in the law? Keep in mind right here, right? Um, which was a lawyer asking him a question, tempting him, right? So from the jump, we know that this question is not a sincere question. They're trying to, they're trying to um, catch him stumbling. You know what I'm saying? They're trying to catch him up, you know, because they, here's this man, Christ, and he's saying that he's the son of God. He should know the answer to these questions, right? Um, even the even the scoffing questions. But this question is not being relayed in a uh, sincere manner. Right. So verse 36, master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Right. And, you know, this is a scoffing question because the Pharisees and the Sadducees both know that, um, you know, that the every commandment, every commandment in the law is sacred and we should do all of them to the best of our ability. Right. So when they ask this question, this, this question is almost uh, sarcasm. Right. 30, verse 37. Slack you. Verse 37, uh, and Christ said unto him, thou shalt love thy Lord, thy God, with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Right. Verse 38. And this is the first and great commandment. Verse 39. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, uh, let's examine this real quick. Right. So. When Christ answered, he said, thou shalt love thy Lord, thy God, with all thy heart and with all thy soul and all thy mind. Right. Um, and then he said the second one was what? To love thy neighbor. Right. These these commandments are very key. Right. And he said this. And this is why it that all the all the commandments hang on these two. Right. I'm going to give an analogy how I like to explain this verse uh, in a minute, man. But this is a very. Um, I would say a very critical passage to understand because uh you know some people can take it out of context and not and not fully you know um 
get the full meat from from what he's trying to say, right? Um, I know there's some some denominations and some some religions, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying that will read this and, and and think that these are the only two things, the only two commandments that we're supposed to abide by, right? You ask, uh, so you ask a colloquial Christian or a Christian nowadays, right? And they and they'll and they'll tell you, you know. They'll tell you the law is done away with. Um, we can't do the law. Christ only commands us to do two laws, and they'll go right here, right? First of all, Christ isn't commanding us to do to to do nothing in this, right? They asked him a question. They said, "Which law, out of all the laws, are the are the best ones?" They didn't say which ones should we do and which ones should we not do, right? First of all, let's let's get that out the way. So it's it's not a matter of Oh, we should only do the ones that he named in in, in this in this uh, scripture. It's not what it's talking about, right? But they'll but they'll they'll read this and they'll take that away from it, right? They'll read this and they and they'll and they'll tell you, right? Any Christian will tell you. They'll say, "Hey, this is the law of Christ, and He only requires to, for us to do two things, and that's to love God and love your neighbor, right? And those things are great. Don't get me wrong; those things are are, are great." Um, but there's a problem, right? They're kind of vague, right? And they're and they're left, they're left for uh for self interpretation. If you just leave, if you, if we just examining love God and love your neighbor, now the playing field is 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 broad. It's wide. And what do I mean by I say that? Because you ask somebody, especially somebody that doesn't know the Bible, right? Um, you know. And you tell them, hey, look, Christ only wants you to love God and love your neighbor. And, then, and they'll be like, oh, for real? I've been doing that my whole life. Why would they say that? Um, because you have to get into deeper questions now. Like, what is required of me to love God? What is required of me to love my neighbor? Right? These questions have to be answered. And if they're not, then it's just left for anybody's uh, anybody's take. And anybody can wing it, right? You ask them, well, how you love God? Well, you gotta believe believe he's exi he exists, and and that's how you know you love God. Well, no, that's not how you know you love God. You know what I'm saying? Uh, they'll tell you, well, how do you how do you know you love your your neighbor? How do I show love to my neighbor? Oh, I'll, I'll, you hold the door for them when they're when they're about to walk behind you, right? Or they're or they're coming up, you hold the door for them, right? You might pay for their meal <laughs> in the drive through, right? Mm, these are these are kind gestures, but the Bible is is a in a Rubik's cube, man. Right. So anything you read, especially in the New Testament, anything you read in the New Testament can be found in the Old Testament. Right. And it gets down to the details and the parameters. Right. So you will read something like love God and love your neighbor. Well, the Bible tells you how to love God and the Bible tells you how to love your neighbor. Right. Um, and then it says on these two hang all the all the prof, all the law and the prophets what does he mean by that in verse 40 right here where he says on these two hang all the law and the prophets right so I, now I'm a, I'm going to bring out the analogy that I love to use right so they asked him uh which which commandment is the greatest right and he says there's two commandments that are great right love god and love your neighbor and he says all the law and the prophets right the Old Testament hang on these two things, these two principles of loving God and loving your neighbor, right? So I'm gonna paint a picture. Picture you have a, a coat rack on the wall, right? It, it could be one of the long ones with the little tree stems coming from it, or it could just be uh, one of those straight across things that's nailed into the wall as soon as you walk in, right? And it has hooks on it, right? Now let's see. Let's say this this. This, this coat rack only has two hooks, right? It has two hooks. Now, on these two hooks, can so when you have two hooks, right, on a, on a coat rack, nine times out of ten, it can hold more than one coat, right? It can hold more than one coat. So say, like, you have, I don't know, let me make up a number. Say you have ten people coming over, right? And that number is through the spirit, right? <laughs> you got 10 people coming over and you got two hooks, right? Well, five of them can go on this hook and five of them can go on that hook, 
You know what I'm saying? It's not limited to just one coat and one coat. That's what he's trying to say here too, right? And so he's saying on these two commandments, on these two hooks, right? Hang all the law and the prophets. All the laws can hang on these two hooks. Why? Because all the laws are teaching these two principles. When you get down to the nitty gritty, each law either goes back to how you love God and how you love your neighbor, right? I'm going to pull up a preset real quick that I just um, thought about. It's off script. Let me see. I think it's... Um, no. Nah. So, um, slack here. Yeah, I can go here. Let's go to the book of First John, <clears throat> right? First John five and three, right? This this is before we before we even get to the the obvious point, right? I'm gonna bring this out because the Bible has the answer for everything, right? And so the you know the first commandment was to love love God, right? All your your heart, your mind, and your soul, right? This is First Corinthians. I mean, uh, what am I saying? First John chapter five and verse three. For this is the love of. Actually, let's start at verse two. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God. How do we love God, right? And keep His commandments. So we know that loving God is keeping His commandments, right? Verse number three. For this is the love of God. That we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous, right? So right out the jump, right out the gate, we don't even have to go to the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it tells you how to love God, right? In the New Testament. Now, let's go back. Let's go back, right? Matthew 22. And here we go. 34. Right here, right? First command, first and greatest commandment, right? Thou shalt love thy Lord, Lord thy God. Second one is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor. And what on these two hang all the law and the prophets. So all the all the commandments should go back to either one of these, right? Now let's see if this is true, right? Process of elimination, right? Um, I'm trying to, I'm gonna go back to where the bulk of where I can get the 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 most bulk of 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 law laws and commandments right if that makes sense where i can go to a scripture where it's just going to lay me out the the most laws and commandments you know a, a well a good chunk of it right and you guys might know what i'm talking about yes i'm talking about talking about the 10 commandments right give you 10 just 10 straight off the bat you know what I'm saying? And we're just going to see if they go back to uh, loving thy Lord, thy God, or loving your neighbor, right? Now watch this. Um, Starting from the top, right? And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord, thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, right? This is the first commandment, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, what does this go back to? Of course, it goes back to loving thy Lord, thy God, right? And what is he required? What does he require of you to love him, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before him. That's one. Let's see what the second one. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in, in the water underneath, right? So no graven images, right? In the context of this, right? is verse number three. And so when you read this, a lot of people will say, well, that means you shouldn't have pictures pictures of uh, flowers in your house and this, that, and the third. That's not what it's talking about. Um, the context of this is to have anything, any graven images to be worshiped, right? 
to, to be reverenced, right? As a God, as an idol, right? This is the context. Verse number five, thou shalt not bow down, bow, bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, right? So here we see, what does God require of you to love him? You can't have no other God before him. Matter of fact, you can't even have no other God but him, right? Now, verse number six, and showing mercy unto the thousand of them that love me. Oh, that's a cut. That's a cut, right? I forgot that was in there. Verse number six, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. And what? And keep my commandments. We just seen this in the New Testament, right? So how do you love him? By keeping his commandments. This is out of the most high God's mouth himself, right? Verse number seven, thou shalt not take thy Lord's, uh, Lord, Salaki, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. So here we see, right, that one, we can't have no other God before him. Two, we can't take his name in vain. What does it mean to take his name in vain, right? Is it saying, uh, oh, my God? No, that's not what it's talking about, right? When you take the, the Lord's name in vain, it literally means that uh, uh, you're doing lip service, right? You're doing lip service. Let me see if I can find a precept, right? That's what it means by taking the Lord's God's name in vain. And we did a video on this. Um, if you want to see it, uh, hit me up or hit any of the brothers up and we'll um, send you the link. I'm going to try to pull up a precept. Um, all right, so this is Isaiah chapter 29 and 13. This is what taking the Lord's name in vain would be, right? Wherefore the Lord said, uh, again, Isaiah 29 and 13, wherefore the Lord said, uh, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men, right? So what is it saying? It's saying that although they honor them, honor him with their lips, right? Their heart is far from him. Um, let's get another one. Matthew 15 and 8. This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, right? <clears throat> and so um, what does this look like in today's time? Um, we see uh, we see celebrities, right? Um Let's just take like, I don't know if she has said this before or not, but let's just take Cardi B, right? We know that the things that Cardi B promotes, we know the thing that Cardi B, the things that Cardi B stands for, right? Um, you know, pretty much the harlotry, trying to uh, spread whoredom amongst our women, right, in our community. And with doing this, she does it proudly. She wins awards for it um, by our oppressors. And she gets on stage and she says, um, first, I just want to thank God, right? You know what I'm saying? A lot of people, without him, none of this would be possible, right? This is taking the Lord's name in vain. Why? Because you're constantly transgressing him. You're not being obedient to him, but yet you want to claim him, right? You want him to claim you, right? This is what it means to take the Lord's name in vain, right? Again, we have a video on this. If you want to uh, if you want a, a more in-depth study on it um, and need some help, uh, comment on this or DM us, DM us on our uh, Instagram page and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Matter of fact, let me switch this banner so y'all can see um, all of our plugs. Bacon, right? So one, back back to the back to the matter at hand right so how do we love god by not having any gods before him and not taking his name in vain right verse number eight remember the sabbath day to keep it holy right this is a rest day required of us right to do nothing really but to just dwell about uh dwell on the most high right in rest why do we rest because he made the world in six well 
he made everything in six days, right? He made the world in six days and he rests on the seventh, right? This is our way of imaging, uh, of mirroring that, you know what I'm saying? Um, and we're supposed to be reverencing him on that day. It's a high holy day. Holy means set apart, right? Meaning that it's held above other days, right? And so we honor him by keeping the Sabbath. That's three, right? Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the, the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that's in with, within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is uh and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Right? So he blessed it and he hallowed it, making it holy, making it set apart. And so we honor him by keeping it. Honor thy mother and thy father, right? And so, right. And so that would be four or five. Yes, yeah, five. I guess these two. Um, so Salaki is. So it definitely would be no other guys before him. Um, not to make any graven images, right? To bow down to. Um, don't take his name in vain. The Sabbath day, right? And then, am I counting that right? No gods before me, no graven images. Thou shalt not bow down to them. Okay, I got that at three. Um, taking his name in vain, keeping the Sabbath day, right? Um, let's see here. Honor thy mother and thy father, and thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God has given thee, right? This is the way how we love our neighbor, right? And the neighbor in this instance would be our father and our mother, right? Also, man, this would ultimately show how you know what i'm saying we love our love god because in doing this in doing this he's showing us the relationship right that we're supposed to have with him if we're being we're supposed to be obedient to our fathers and our mothers i.e we're supposed to be obedient to the most high right um again thou shalt not kill verse 13 right this is another law that goes back to loving your neighbor. Um, and in, in the so-called Black, Hispanics, and Native American community today, we'd be a whole lot better off if we understand this concept. We got into it with a girl um, on the street um, last week about this commandment right here. Because it says, thou shalt not kill. And a lot of people don't read this in context. Keep in mind, you have to read everything in context and understand where the Most High is coming from. Um so when you read thou shalt not kill it probably wasn't even going to be read like that back in the ancient times it probably would say something like no kill and they would just have to understand what he was talking about um and you get a clearer picture of what he means throughout the bible a lot of people say well that means the whole thing is contradictory because there's killing all through the bible and he commanded us to kill certain people now when it says thou shalt not kill it's talking about um murder and what is murder Murder is simply killing somebody or shedding innocent blood, right? Shedding innocent blood. We're not talking about um, self-defense. We're not talking about recompense. None of that, right? We're talking about shedding innocent blood, right? And we, our communities would be a whole lot better off if we stayed away from shedding innocent blood, right? People die over colors. <clears throat> People die over, over females, right? All these things are not punishable by death, right? You'd be killing somebody that was innocent, right? Um, verse number 14. And that's how you love your brother, by not taking his life, especially if he didn't do nothing. <clears throat> Thou shalt not commit adultery. Speaking of other men's uh, wives or, or females, right? You shouldn't be sleeping with your, with your man's girl, right? Um, and, you know, again, I mentioned Cardi B. Uh, 
but also in our culture, blacks and Hispanics, the biggest thing in our culture, man, especially when you hear our music is, you know, rob, kill, like, I'm going to take, I'm going to take old dude, girl, right? And that's glorified. There's an artist um, that, that I'm pretty sure we know, his name is Trey Songs, right? And he, his nickname is Mr. Studio Girl. And he makes money off of that nickname, Mr. Studio Girl. He got songs talking about it, right? A lot of people got songs talking about committing adultery. And we wonder why it happens. And, you know, and it's a slippery slope once you commit, commit adultery. Because you commit adultery, then somebody might be mad enough to kill you, right? Or might be mad enough to try to kill you, and then they end up in jail. And it's just a slippery slope, right? Our communities would be a whole lot better if we stayed away from this, right? And that's why we're commanded not to commit adultery, right? Why? Because that's loving your neighbor. Um, let's go to verse 15, right? Thou shalt not steal, right? Thou shalt not steal. Um, and this is this is simple, man. These are these are simple laws that we can keep that will ultimately turn our communities upside down. Right. If we would understand that, hey, man, what's mine is yours. You wouldn't have to steal. You know, there's laws in the Bible where um, if, if a man's wax poor, you know, you're supposed to take that brother in. You know what I'm saying? Let him work for you. You know, get his Jeffrey on for about seven years and then you can let him go. Um, set him free with, you know, with some land, a donkey and all that stuff. Right. And so now this brother's back on his feet. He ain't got to steal. Right. Now, if we go back, if we can get back to those type of laws, man, our communities would be a whole lot better, right? Um, and that's why you see um, a lot of these other nations, man, um, don't really be living on the street like that, like Asians and uh, East Indians, right? They all look out for each other. They all they all handle things in house, right? They all look out for each other, and that's how we should be. Um, verse sixteen: Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, right? Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. What is bearing false witness? Uh, crash course on bearing false witness, right? Pretty much lying on 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 somebody, right? Lying on your friend is that uh, if if and a lot of a lot of times we do this and um, there's really not even no reason why we do it, right? We just do it just to just to gossip, you know. Um, so bearing false witness would be like. Um, if I know, if I know brother Yeshaya took the orange juice out of my refrigerator, right? If I know that for a fact, because I seen him do it. And I I I I blatantly accuse brother Azrael of taking it, right? When I know he didn't do it, now I'm bearing false witness on Azrael because he ain't he ain't take it. And I know he didn't take it, right? So bearing false witness on somebody. Is pretty much lying on that person, saying they did something that they didn't do, right? And this this happens a lot in the hood, right? Oh, bro, it was it was it was it was it was your I seen your girl, bro, and she, and she was with so and so, knowing good and well you didn't see his girl with so and so, right? But now you got him mad, right? And he might beat her up, right? Or he might go kill kill the dude that you say he, she was messing with. Slippery slopes, man. If we can just control these these simple things right in our community, imagine where our community would be. You know what I'm saying? Imagine where we'd be at as a nation. Um, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's, right? And th these are the five things right here, right? So honor. Uh, honor thy mother and thy father, right? Loving thy neighbor. Thou shalt not kill, loving thy neighbor. Thou shalt not commit adultery, loving thy neighbor. Thou shalt not steal, loving thy neighbor, right? Thou shalt not bear false witness, loving thy neighbor, right? Thou shalt not uh, covet thy neighbor's house, right? So, Salaki, I guess honor thy father and mother would be um, how you love the most high God, right? You know, and now we just go short, show to to that would go towards like of course like we we discussed before honoring the relationship we have with them to show how we honor the relationship that we have with our uh 
uh, the Father, right? The Most High. And then also because that your mother and your father is the way the Most High brought you in into this world. You know what I'm saying? They're the vessel that he used to bring into this world, right? He chose them to bring you in. So you, why wouldn't you want to honor the Most High by, you know, treating your parents good, honoring them, or being obedient to them, right? Taking care of them in their old age. All these things reflect back on how you love the Most High, right? And in these last five, right? Thou shalt not kill. Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And thou shalt not covet nothing of your neighbors, right? Now, coveting. What is coveting? Coveting is wanting something that's that belongs to somebody else, right? In lamest terms, wanting something that belongs to somebody else, um, in an envious manner, in a jealous manner, right? That that can lead to strife, um, can lead somebody to despise somebody else. Man, I just don't. Man, he always winning, man. He always winning. Man. Everything always go his way, man. He's, he, that's the girl I wanted, man. Right? I wanted, I wanted a girl that looked like that, right? You know what I'm saying? I want, man. This man house looked ten times better than mine. You know what I'm saying? All this, 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 all these things, man, can lead to malice, right? And can lead somebody to despise somebody, and ultimately treat that, treat that brother or sister in a weird way. Um, the brother Yeshia always likes to say, "Why are you being weird to me?" Right? These things can lead somebody to act in a weird way. Right. And if we cut this out, um, actually, there's a there's a song, man, um, a gospel song. You know, it used to be one of my my favorite songs in Christianity. I think I had it pinned on my Twitter once upon a time when I had a Twitter and it said. Uh, I might have to paraphrase it because uh, it slipped, but it's like. Um. um Paraphrasing, it says, um, I'm not I'm not going to get mad when I see God has done something for you because I know uh, he can do it for me. Right. And so understanding that principle is very key. Right. Whatever God can do for somebody else that's close to you, uh, um, he can do it for you, too. And you got to believe that and stop coveting your neighbor's stuff. Right. Um, he, he blesses your neighbor. But if they're if they're a I'm going to play on these words. Right. And I said I saw a post playing on these words, too. Right. If he blessed my neighbor with something, I don't have to covet it. That means he's right next door. He's handing out blessings. He's right next door. Right. Um, in the world, people would call this. Uh, people would say this about Santa Claus. Right. You know what I'm saying? As he goes from door from house to house, going through chimneys and whatnot. But this is the most high God. Right. If the most high God is blessing your neighbor. And to the point where it's visible for you to see, best believe he right next door, man. You know what I'm saying? That favor should be able to fall onto you if you keep these commandments and you don't covet, right? So we see even in the Ten Commandments, you got five that deal with um, loving God. And you got five that deal with loving your neighbor. This is why Christ said this. <clears throat> this is why Christ said this, right? <clears throat> At the end. He said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, because all of these can go back to either what? Lo all the commandments can either go back to loving God or loving thy neighbor, right? <clears throat> um, but again, man, some people take this out of, out of context and tell you that, hey, look, they won't even read verse 40, right? And they'll stop at verse 39, right? And, and after stopping at verse 39, they say, well, oh, Christ is telling us all we got to do is love our neighbor and love, love God, right? And then they'll tell you, this is the law of Christ. This is the law of Christ, right? Um, but um, we got a few scriptures for that, right? For that law of Christ doctrine, right? Because first and foremost, man, we know that Christ did not come to do anything that, you know, his father didn't intend, intend on doing, right? As we know, Christ is not God, um, and, he, and he'll say that himself, right? I think uh, you can you can go look that up at anywhere really in the Bible. But um, a quick scripture off the dome, man. Go to John fourteen and twenty eight. He'll let you know that his father is greater than he, right? But um, let's go to John. What do I want? What do I want? 
そうだねうん Let's go to John 5 and 30, man. To debunk this. Well, not debunk, man, but because, you know, there is a law of Christ. But we got to understand the law of Christ is the law of God, right? The law of Christ is the law of God. And this is why. This is John chapter 5 and verse number 30, right? And it reads, write this down if you, if you haven't seen this. Uh, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. Who is he hearing from? Keep in mind, this is red letter. This is Christ, right? As I hear, I judge. Who is he hearing from? Is he hearing from himself? No, man. He's hearing from the Father, right? And my judgment is just because I seek not of my own will, but if he doesn't seek his own will, who does he seek it from? Let's keep reading. But the will of the Father, which has sent me, right? So somebody sent this man to do a certain mission, right? Not a mission of his own, but a mission of the sender, not the mission of the one that was sent. Christ is sent because he has accomplished a mission that was given to him by his father, right? And we see the mission that was sent by his father all the way back in Exodus, right? Even when we just read the, the, the Ten Commandments, right? This is the beginning of his mission, right? And Christ didn't come to do anything different. That's why he said that all these laws and commandments hang on these two. Why? Because that's the way his, the, the Most High set it up, right? They either go back to loving God or what? Loving thy neighbor. Um, let's see. Uh, let's go to... Uh, I'm going to get an example real quick, right? Another thing people like to stumble on. Um, before I get that, though, I'm going to go to Leviticus 19 and 17. Because we, um, we showed uh, how to love, you know, how to love God, and that's keeping his commandments, right? And that's just a, a precept upon precept. But um, there's also a precept upon precept. Actually, no, I'm going to get that last. I'm going to get that last because it's going to flow into what I was going to bring up anyway. Let's get First John chapter 2, and I'm going to start at verse 7. First John chapter 2 and 7. This is going to be perfect. Watch. Um, so... Again, people will people will, will come up to you and they'll argue that you know Christ came uh, with his own set of laws, doing away with the Father's laws, right? Which sounds it just sounds crazy coming out of my mouth. Um, but and they, and they'll and they'll ultimately cling to the law of Christ, which they believe is love God and love your neighbor, right? Or love people, which is a broad term, like we discussed. And that can be very misconstrued and very personal to where anybody can come up with their own standards uh, of these things, right? Especially if they don't read the Bible, right? And now, so with the proper understanding, now we can start reading things in context and reading things uh, to get the full meat out of these passages, right? Um, a lot of times uh, people read this and they overlook things, right? Um, and I'm going to get into it so you, you know what I mean. Concerning the law of Christ, right? Because a lot of people are big on doing away with the old the old laws and bringing in the new laws, right, for Christ. And that's just not, it's not true, man, because Christ didn't come to do anything, um, you know, contrary to that of the past. And we'll show that um, after this too, right? But this is 1 John uh, chapter 2. Verse seven, brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, right? And so he's he's letting you know I'm writing no new commandment, but a lot of people read right over this, right? But an old commandment, which he had from the beginning, right? So he's saying, hey, look, the commandment I'm about to tell you, um, it's not a new commandment. It might sound new to you guys, but it's not a new commandment. It's from old, right? 
The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning, right? Now, verse number eight, they'll go straight to verse number eight, right? They won't read verse number seven, but they'll go to verse number eight. It says, again, a new commandment I write unto you. Now, he just told us he wasn't going to write a new commandment. So what is he saying? So check this out, right? You got to understand that the people he's speaking to, who did Christ come for? Matthew chapter 15 and 24, he will tell you that he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, if you're a, if you're lost, right, that means you don't you don't know what's going on. Right. So he's speaking to a whole bunch of people that don't know what's going on. Right. They might have some awareness of some laws and some statutes. Right. But ultimately. Right. They, they need to, They need somebody to help them, you know, get themselves together. Right. And this is what Christ is doing throughout the whole Bible. So when he's when he's teaching. Right. He says, brethren, I write no new commandment unto you. Right. And then in verse eight, he says, again, a new commandment I write unto you. Right. Is he schizo? No, he's not. You got to understand what he's doing. Now, he's speaking to an audience, right, that might not know of this commandment, right? Even though it's going to be new to them, doesn't make this commandment a new commandment, right? It's new to them, but it was never new, right? It's a commandment of old, and that's what he's saying, right? Again, a new commandment I write unto you which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is past and the true light now shining, right? He, he that saith he is the light and hate, this is the commandment he's writing, right? He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him, right? Verse 11, but he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walk in darkness, right? I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven unto you for his name's sake, right? Um, con, 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 right? So what is he saying here, right? He's pretty much telling you to love your brother, right? Don't hate your brother, right? He's saying, if you hate your brother, you're in darkness, right? This is not a new concept. This is not a new commandment, right? Why? Because we can see it in Leviticus. Let's go to the book of Leviticus, Chapter, I'm tripping, Leviticus 19 and 17, right? This is a commandment he got from old, as he said, right? All the way back in Leviticus. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt not in any wise, I mean, thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Right. And this is what we just read. Right. To not hate thy brother and to not suffer sin upon him. Right. And so we got to understand these um, these what's what's happening. The law of Christ. Or no, it's, it's not nothing, nothing new. Right. It's not nothing new. And he's just bringing light to the things that were forgotten. Right. So it might be new to the people that are hearing it. But these are commandments that were of old and that we can find actually in the, in the text. Right. It's all about doing our part and reading these things. Right. Now, how do we know that Christ didn't come to um, to to create his own laws and commandments? Right. How do we know that that Christ didn't come to to do his own thing? Right. Say, hey, most high he tried. But um, I think there's a better way. Right. Let's go to Matthew chapter five. And all, all three of these passages that I'm going to, man, the first John, Matthew 22, and Matthew 5 are, are beautiful, beautiful scriptures to go into, right? And beautiful scriptures that um, are often misinterpreted um, by um, the Christian church, just calling a spade a spade. And, um, it's, and all you have to do is just read, right? Um, when I first came into the truth, man, I remember reading this 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 one that we got put up right now, man. Thinking about how how am I how am I gonna explain this one? How does this fit with the principles of the Bible? And all I had to do was just keep reading, right? Um, so Matthew five and seventeen. This is a classic, right? Christians love going here. Christians love going here, especially when they're trying to prove that the law is done away with. Right. So Matthew 5 and 17, 
Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And what they'll say is, since he came to fulfill, they're saying that he fulfilled the whole law and he fulfilled the prophets. So now everything is done. When he when he was on the cross and he said, it's finished, everything was fulfilled. And now we don't have to keep laws, statutes, commandments no more. You know what I'm saying? The Old Testament is done away with, right? That's not what it was talking about, right? The things that he was he came to fulfill were the things that uh, were written of him to fulfill. Um, I was going to, um, matter. Of, uh, I'll pull it up just for the edification of you guys, right? We're going to see what he came to fulfill, right? Uh, let's go to Luke. Luke 24 and 44, right? Uh, Luke 24 and 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. He came to fulfill everything that was concerning him, right? So if there was something concerning him, he, he fulfilled it, right? Now, there's when you read the Bible, there's things that we have to fulfill too, right? We got to fulfill the law, statutes, and commandments, right? And when, when we go, when we die, right, if we haven't fulfilled those things, hey, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't finish that, that mission that Christ came to do for him. He finished that mission. But if we don't fulfill these laws, statutes, and commandments when we pass, right, we, we're not fulfilling. We're not going to fulfill that mission, right? And he's going to tell you, hey, look, depart from me. I never knew you, right? Because what boss wants to go out and tell you to do something, right, and, and you come back and you didn't do it? You're getting fired, and that's what's going to happen. You're going to get fired, right? So what did he come to do? To fulfill everything that was concerning him in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms, Right? Because we know Christ came in the volume of the book, right? And so when you read the law of Moses, the Torah, when you read the prophets, right? When you read the Psalms, right? You're going to see Christ all throughout these things. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, let's get one more, right? What did he come to fulfill? Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 3 and verse 18, I believe. But those things which God before has showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Right. So everything that that was written that he was going to suffer, he was he came to fulfill. Right. Like the like, you know, all the stripes. Right. Him being strung up. Right. Him, him getting pierced through the side. Right. All these things, his bones not being um, corrupted. Right. All these things that was written of him had to come to pass and he fulfilled those things that's what he's saying and why is he saying this right he's gonna let us know because somebody might argue i mean they might they might say i mean i see where you're coming from but i don't think that's what that means i think it means that he did away with everything right so think not that i come to destroy the law first of all you just gotta stop right there what did he just say out the gate think not that i come to destroy the law so how can you read this and then at the end of the same verse, get from it that he's doing away with the law, right? We can't, we, we got to keep everything in its proper context, man. We got to, we got to be honest, right? Have biblical integrity. Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Fulfill what? Those things concerning him. Verse number 18, for verily I say unto you, right? This is very key. All I had to do was keep reading. All we have to do is keep reading. All you have to do is keep reading a lot of the times in these passages. And it's going to give you what you need. Right. The truth of the Bible. Right. Um, the doctrine that won't be able to gain, be gainsaid. Right. Now, you just explain 17. I mean, verse 17 to them perfectly. They still not getting it. Right. They still don't believe you. All you got to do is read 18. For verily I say unto you till heaven and earth pass. Now you now you got to ask them, has heaven and earth passed yet? Right. Well, I can look up. I can still I can see the heavens. Right. I can see the clouds. Right. I can see the blue sky. I can see, the, you know, you know, I can see the heavens. The heavens are still there. 
um, Earth. Has Earth passed? Well, I'm still on Earth. We know Earth, um, cons- cons- uh, according to Genesis, is the dry land, right? So I can see dry land that I'm walking on and I can see the water. That means, hey, this dry land is still peeking up out this water. Earth ain't passed away yet. It says what? For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Because everything won't be fulfilled. It, everything wasn't fulfilled when Christ died on the cross, right? Everything was fulfilled of him, um, you know, um, of, his, of, his, of his, I'll say this, everything was fulfilled of his, his flesh. Everything that was concerning him in the flesh was fulfilled, right? When he died on the cross, but everything wasn't fulfilled. Why do we know this? Because it just told us that there's going to be one day where heaven and earth will pass. And then, you know what I'm saying? This, these things are going to be fulfilled, right? You and you got to tell them because they, they might argue that point. And then you, and you, you tell them, well, he did fulfill everything. You got to ask him, well, isn't he coming back? Isn't he coming back one more time? Well, if he has to come back one more time, that means all hasn't been fulfilled, right? That means all hasn't been fulfilled. So it says, for what? For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth have passed, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. What is it saying, one jot or one tittle, right? Um, to, today we have sayings like, um, I'm going to dot my I's and cross my T's. It's saying not one dotted I, not one cross T shall pass from the law, right, till all be fulfilled. And it's plain upon tables. Christ did not come to do away with his father's law, statutes, and commandments, or the, the testimonies of the prophets, right? Every prophecy has to come to pass, and we have to fulfill the whole law, right? The law, statutes, and commandments, right? Um, and there's a way that you can fulfill the whole law, statutes, and commandments, right? You know what I'm saying? And um, and clearly, Christ is, is is telling us that we can do these things. Why? Because another classic, right? And I'll end on this. I'll end on this. Another classic. Because a lot of people say you can't do it, right? You know, you can't do it. It's too hard. We're all sinners, brother, right? Well, let's go here. Philippians 4 and 13, the classic. I can do all things through Christ with strengthening in me. Whenever somebody goes to comes up to you, right, and they want to argue the point that we can't keep the law, statutes, and commandments, you pull out Philippians 4 and 13, right? And you have them read it. And it says, I can do all things through Christ with strengthening me. And if you believe in Christ, you believe in uh, Philippians 4 and 13, right? Because Christ didn't come to do away with the law, statutes, and commandments, right? And he was supporting the law, statutes, and commandments the whole time he was walking the earth, right? And so when we read, again, what is the two greatest commandments? And I agree with him. I agree with Big Bro, right? I agree with Christ. I agree with Hamashiach when he said this. Let's get it. And we'll give the sense. We'll wrap it up, right? said unto him, right, master, which is the greatest commandment, right? And and Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, right? This is the first commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In verse number 40, all the law on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, right? Because every single law, right, and every testimony go back to what? Telling you how to love God and telling you how to love your neighbor, man. And with that, I yield my time. And um, Lord willing, we'll be on tomorrow. I uh, hope you guys were edified. If you have any questions, please DM us, comment on the video, get our attention. Um, and I hope you guys have a safe day tomorrow. Um, whether you're going to work, whether you, you started school, uh, whatever you do, though, man, um, study hard and um, let's prepare for the Shabbat, right? Um, but with that being said, I'm Brother Dana, and I'm signing off. Uh, Shalom and peace.